Thank you again for tuning in to Will Mega TV. Please subscribe, click like, drop your thoughts in the comments area, and if you really want to see us continue to push out great content, support us. Cash app Will Mega. That's dollar sign Will Mega. Dollar sign Will Mega. Thank you. Powerful mics. <laughs> Thank y'all for coming and supporting us on a Saturday. It's, a, it's so beautiful to see so many, uh, so many people here for the opening of a library. That's, that's a beautiful day, and, and we're blessed to have Eliasa Shabazz here. With us. Yeah. I know. I saw you February 21st at my father's memorial celebration. We were so honored to have Dr. Mark Lamont Hill uh, as our MC while we welcomed Dr. Angela Davis to the Shabazz Center and several others Ben Crump, oh, yeah. Amy Goodman, Joy, Joy Reed. Reed. Right. And to have you as our MC was a dream come true. It was an honor, and we hope to see you again May 19th <laughs> the both, next celebration. That is both compliment and request. Yes, I got you. I got you. And, but it was, it's a blessing. You know, I, I had a very busy week that week, and uh, then you, you asked me to come, and I said, yeah, I mean, I, how can I say no to that? You know, Malcolm X's daughter says, hey, can you come up and MC the event memorializing, you know, uh, your father's tragic passing? But it's not just that your father means so much to me, it's, it's what you mean to us. Yeah. It's what you yes. mean to us. You are in an interesting position. Your father's one of the most significant figures to ever be produced in this country. Yes. yes. And he means so much to everybody in this room, everybody around the country, everybody around the world. And yet, you managed to follow in that tradition in your own way. Um, not just your father's tradition, but also your mother's tradition. What does it mean for you to be in that tradition? What does it mean for you to follow the legacy? And you know, honestly, um, it wasn't like I set out, I guess we don't need microphones, right? It wasn't like I set out to follow in anybody's legacy or to or, to, it, or in, to be in my, my mother or father's footsteps. But I think it's the way my mother raised us. Yes. You know, when she lost her life, I took a step back and I looked at this woman, you know, who was just in her 20s when she witnessed her husband's assassination. Mm -hmm. A week prior to that, she lay in bed with her husband as a firebomb was thrown in, in, in the room where her baby slept and she was pregnant. And to have been able to raise six girls, you know, with specific values, you know, to be proud of who they were as women, as Muslim, as people of the African diaspora, you know, to, have a, you know, to be able to st stand on our own, I just thought was amazing, you know, and I often question how did she do it because she never accepted no or I can't as an answer for herself because she understood who she was. Yes. You know, she knew her history, her identity was intact, yeah. and her girls did not rely on other people to determine our self worth because of what she instilled in us. And so that's what I set out to do with my books to make sure that when a child opens up a book, that they could see a reflection of, them, of themselves. And also that they could learn the truth about Malcolm X, about Betty Shabazz, about our our ancestors, our foreparents. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I I I love your books um, because they attempt to tell the proper story of who your parents were and who all of us can be. Mm -hmm. Who who was young Malcolm? Right. Who we are, right? So my father, you know, there's this whole notion that you go, that, you, that you're an illiterate, right? And that you go to jail and miraculously walk out as an icon. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> right. And so the reason that my father was able to walk out as Malcolm X is because his father and his mother instilled specific values and they provided yeah. them. Yeah. 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 And it says that it does take a village to raise your yeah. yes. And that it is our responsibility to provide a foundation for yes. all of our children, yes. whether we biologically birth them or not, rather than think that somehow magically their 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 education curriculum is going to do the right thing you know but instead of thinking and sitting back and waiting and complaining about our education curriculum we know like Malcolm's parents and like our four parents that we have to do the work and so Malcolm's father was a member of the PTA he he purchased land that was reserved for whites only during the height of Jim Crow they told him you can buy the land, but you can't live on it. And so we know <laughs> that he said, okay, but he and his family lived on the land. And that's how Malcolm, you know, seeing these parents that he perceived to be invincible, mm -hmm. his mother instilled um, the desire to read, you know, she was a polyglot. She spoke many languages. Mm -hmm. And so she instilled these values of excellence in her children. They knew who they were. She, her, her, his father was the uh, pre chapter president of the Garvey Movement, Uni Universal Negro Improvement Association, um, which was very important during that time of, the, of our um, history, of our contemporary history in America. And, um, you know, so they instilled great values. We as a family knew that our history didn't begin in slavery, but that mm -hmm. we were trafficked, our bodies were trafficked, we were kidnapped, we were held in bondage against our will and all these horrible terror, you know, these things. And the reason that I, you know, wanted to go to the Whitney Plantation while I was in um, New Orleans. Um, but just understanding, you know, the trauma that happened, but knowing that the reason the trauma happened is because people, you know, unfortunately try to crush us and it makes me think of Toni Morrison when she said who are you without your oppression <laughs> who are you without your racism who are you without the ability to imprison me right you're just an insecure little old self right <laughs> so so it's it's having the conversation like my father said yes Do you, do you think about, well, I think about, I'll ask you, I'll tell you what I think about. I often think about who your father would have been. His trajectory is so extraordinary. From 48 to 52, from 52 to 65, just even from 64 to 65. 19. Yeah, 19, yeah, I'm sorry, yes, yeah, some of these years, not his age. Um, for, it, oh, in these specific years, I, we saw these radical changes in, in shifts. And, I'm off, and, and, and I think the saddest part, and I thought about this yesterday because um, Carolyn Bryant, the, the woman who, uh, who lied on Emmett Till, uh, who caused his death, she got to live to be 88. 88. And poor Emmett Till, yeah, yeah 14, you know, when he died in 55. And I think how profoundly unfair it is that we never got to see who Emmett Till could be, what he could be. And I think about that with your father. I think, you know, God. Yeah. What he would, what he means, uh, what he means to us as a martyr, but what he could have meant to us living. Mm -hmm. yeah, so much. Mm. As is that something that you think about, like the, the what is, the what could us, or, or is that is that even possible? No, I don't think of that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I accept the life that we have mm -hmm. and try to learn from the challenges. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm grateful that my father lived at the time that he did that he got to go and make his hajj and experience the first world nation, you know, the land of the Bible, the land of the Quran, the land of the Torah. You know, I'm so grateful for his experience, you know, things that sometimes we take for granted, right? But understanding that he was just a young man, he was only 39 when he was born. So to have can make this enormous contribution at such a young age and sacrifice because of his love for his people and his belief in our humanity. Um, so I don't, I don't really think about that. I, you know, try to be 
as realistic, you know, yeah. and very as possible. Talk to me about your, talk to me about your mother. You know, one of the things, and I, and I know that Bernice King about this as well, there's a way that we think that these larger than life men navigate the world alone or that their wives are just kind of like side uh, or, or, or not, not they're sort of additions to the story but they're not central to it and there's no Martin without Coretta there's no Nelson without Betty and there's no Malcolm without Betty but I think we don't tell that story of who is Betty Shabbat so, you know, I wrote this other book, Betty, before I asked. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, you know, when, when, while writing it, like I learned that my mother played the drums as a mm. child. You know, just so many things I learned that um, she, her household environment comprised of women, you know, and being in the church, who were the leaders of the housewives league that challenged um, the meatpacking industry that would not hire black people. And they said, and these are women. And they said, if you if you can take our money, then you can employ our children yes. and our yes. husbands. And they were women who who challenged this, I think, billion dollar industry, you know, to ensure that um, we were hired. And, you know, my mother grew up in the church, you, you, you know, so many things. I remember when I was um, you know, maybe in the 90s, I said, gosh, mom, you know, you need to read Deepak Chopra's universe, seven principles of spiritual success. And she said, seven, seven principles of spiritual success. She said, you need to work. <laughs> you know, like, and so I said, gosh, you know, she needs to be softer. She needs to feel the spiritual world. And of course, when she passed away, I said, of course she was. That's how she survived, right? Right. right. And so writing um, Betty Before X just helped me see why my mother, why my father chose her as his wife. Yeah. I, I, there's some writers in the room, I'm sure. I mean, anybody here a writer? I ain't never been to a library with a writer. <laughs> and I want to make sure that the next generation of young writers and are, are sort of prepared for that journey. What does it mean to you to be a writer? And why do you write? So, you know, when I was growing up, I loved writing. I loved storytelling. I loved choreographing. I loved the arts and music. And, and, and But I thought, because I loved it so much, that that wasn't going to be my job. Mm. That my job had to be something that I didn't like. Mm. Right? Mm. And so I thought, okay, I'm going to go to I was started off as a math major until I went to college, and I was like, what is this? <laughs> and then, you know, I decided I was going to be a medical doctor, and, you know, I'm not really fond of blood and germs and all that stuff, so right. that didn't... That ain't the business. <laughs> <laughs> right? But, you know, what I realized is that for our young people, that when we choose our careers, that it, it shouldn't be based on how we're going to how much money we're gonna make, right? But what are we passionate about? Yes. You know, what are, and, and I just enjoyed writing and creating stories. And especially because when I grew up, I didn't read Dick Jane and Spock, right? We learned about um, the Malian Empire, how, you know, they created books that they, they wrote the first books. Had it not been for them, we would never have a book, right? And we learned about the scientists and archaeologists and farmers of the continent, about the founders of civilization. And so we were really, you know, balanced. And when I went to a girl girls prep school, boarding school, um, I would mentor and tutor math, because that was my subject, to uh, young people. And I didn't understand why they were withdrawn, right? That they weren't animated and lively, right? And then going to college and going and, and, and working in lockup facilities, and again, seeing young people who weren't animated and loving and excited about life, like my sisters and I have five sisters, six of us close in age growing up together. We were animated and lively and we loved ourselves. And it, it dawned on me that they did not have the same upbringing that I had. 
And so I made sure that whatever it was I did, that I provided a curriculum where they could know their value, their worth, and find their joys and their passions. What you gonna write next? <laughs> so now I'm actually, so you know, I have to take it off my social media because I'm like, oh, maybe I better wait till I have it because I don't want anybody to stop me from making it happen. But we are um, with Sony TriStar mm. doing um, television series about the awakening of Malcolm X. Just to make sure that that is it's accurate. I mean, my father grew up in the Midwest, yeah. in the rural Midwest. He was, you know, and it was a really exciting childhood. For me. And when I wrote the uh, Malcolm X, the boy who to become Malcolm X, was the illustrator. The images that they were bringing were of this little boy with cut off or ripped off overalls and barefoot. And I was like, pull the pants down to his ankles and put some shoes on. Right. <laughs> you know, and so it's so important that we control the narrative yes. of our story. Yes. One more question, and I'm gonna take two questions from y'all. Do you ever feel, as a writer, and I feel like this sometimes, that because of who you are in the world, you can't, there's certain things you love to write but can't? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I write about what I want to write. You know, because I believe, you know, God is the judge, you know, not people. And I want to be in tune with what I like and what I don't like. But then I know that, like, say if I posted something about um, a new pair of shoes or, right, you know, that, you know, you have those people who make the remarks, sister, sister, you know, whatever about shoes or, or when I was in college and I had on lipstick and the, you know, someone said, sister, you know, that's swine on your lips. And so I asked my mother, can I wear lipstick? She said, girl, if you want to wear lipstick, you can wear the lipstick, enjoy it. You know? Um, but again, that's being comf you know, comfortable in the skin you're in. Yeah. That's an important lesson for everybody out here, particularly the young writers. Don't confine yourself. Don't constrain yourself. Mm -hmm. Write about what you want to write about. That doesn't mean that you have responsibilities. Right. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't think about our people, think about justice, think about freedom. But there's a space for joy. There's a space for love. You can write a novel. You can write a romance novel. You can write a children's book. You can write an adult book. You can write a research paper. You can write a, a poem. Like There's a range of ways to be a writer and, and don't limit yourself or, or let the world tell you that you can't do those things. Uh, we got time for just two questions before we wrap. Yeah, we'll go right here. Couple things. Um, oh, we have time for just a single question. <laughs> <laughs> that has to be an actual question. So y'all want to do it? Oh, this is not Philadelphia, but so close to Philadelphia. This counts. I'm from Philly. If you ever get a chance, go to Uncle Bobby's coffee shop. Oh, talk as long as you want. Talk, don't talk. Take the time. And, 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 and I'm older than most people here. Your father was a big influence on me. I never met him. I was one of the founders of the National Black Holistic Society. Mm -hmm. I spent Labor Day weekend, Memorial Day weekend, and usually the week between Christmas and New Year's <coughs> for years with your mother. Okay, and I want to tell you, Malcolm had a big impact on me. Sister Betty had a bigger impact because most people don't know how great her mother really was. Yeah. And the fact that she ended up at Megger's Eggers College in New York, Brooklyn, teaching right. <laughs> was a fantastic woman. Yes. And in fact, when she passed, the place called King's Lodge in New York, yeah. that we held retreats at, changed the name to, to Betty Shabazz Holistic Center. Yeah. And I just want to thank you. You know, and I just want to say, you are absolutely right. And there are so many times when I take a step back and I look at the woman, not the mother that I have, mm -hmm. but the woman that I have the opportunity to know, mm -hmm. to learn from, you know, that I have the opportunity to learn what the, the importance of self-love. Mm -hmm. When she taught her girls, the environment that she provided for us mm -hmm. was very strategic and in retrospect. Mm -hmm. We had a, a statue of this woman that was carved in Haiti. 
walk in, in a walking uh, motion, holding a, a child in hand, a basket on her head. And it said that you can do anything that you want. And, and, and all of these things that I learned, it was because she wanted us to understand to first love ourselves. Because if you don't love yourself, you can't love others. As much as I love me is how I love you. Right? And so it is the reason that I can step away from New Orleans and come here for this moment out of love and then go back. Right? Because you know, if we don't love ourselves, if we don't know how to love ourselves, we can't love one another. We don't even want to be with each other. And I think that that was a, a really important lesson that my father provided us, right? And it was a great lesson that my mother said she learned from her husband as much as she had such an impact on, on her husband. So thank you so much for sharing. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. So, so I wanted to just, um, we're, we're all just in all of you. Uh, there's a lot of girls watching virtually. Um, we have an a initiative called Girls Can Do Anything here. You talk about self-love, and my question is like, you know, you have this confidence to write what you want, do what you want, wear your bright red lipstick, you're beautiful. But you also not only have that self-love, but you have a sisterhood of six and well beyond of women. There's so many girls who struggle with self-love and sisterhood, not just girls, but women, and building sisterhood with other black women. That how-to, can you say more about that for people who didn't grow up with strong parents like some of us, but the secret to self-love and sisterhood for our girls and women, particularly black girls. You know, Again, I think it was the images that my mother provided, right? Because I know even joining a women's organizations that sometimes there is, even though we're in these sisterhoods, you know that there's still some challenges, but I think it's just so important not to forget what history has shown us as far as slavery, right? and all of the effort that went into the self-destruction, right? All of this effort that went into crushing hope and, and, and so forth. But I think, you know, as my mother made sure that we grew up with the images and the historical perspectives and being proud of those um, individuals, he spoke about Phyllis Wheatley. We talk about Harriet Tubman. Let's also talk about Cleopatra. You know, let's talk about Queen and Zynga. Let's look at the women king and find pride, you know, in these women and and love on on these women so that we can love ourselves and, and you know. Mm. Everybody And I think it's important to that when we go into these sisterhoods that we bring this kind of um, information with us. I love that information. Thank you so much. Everybody, this is uh an honor. Oh, yeah. Big job. I consider you a friend, and I still feel honored every time I meet you in your presence. Um, I'm grateful that you all share time with us. Uh, we're going to uh, head downstairs and get some books to sign. Uh, but other than that, I just want to encourage everybody to keep reading, keep writing, keep building. And that next generation is going to be a little bit closer to freedom than even we were. So thank you. Thank you.